Hi, I'm John Groders. Today on No Shame, I interview one of our own, Keith Mitchell. Keith Mitchell is the leader of a new enterprise that we are launching called Festivy. And as the leader of Festivy, he has been speaking with film festival directors all over the country. Stay tuned. So our guest on the podcast today is Keith. Hi, Keith. Hi, John. I've been thinking it's been too long since I've come out and hang out at your sweet pad, and I think that's because you haven't invited me, if I'm not mistaken. Mi casa su casa. You Good can enough. come whenever you want. Su casa. I knew a girl named su casa. Um, I want to talk today on the podcast. So um, for those of you that don't know, Keith and I work together. We've been working together for years. And when uh, COVID-19 hit America, the way our company responded, like many, was everyone sort of brought their computers home, worked from home, and we started launching deeply into a brand new product. And uh, it's called Festivy, and it's right over your shoulder, Keith. And Keith's been uh, headlining this this endeavor. So what is Festivy? Yeah, it's backwards. (laughs) (laughs) What, 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 What is it? John, Festivy is a platform for fi- film festivals and events to go digital um, right from their computer. And ostensibly, in a perfect world, we can offer everything that festivals offer um, live. We can do in, from their pajamas, basically. Hmm. And uh, that's the goal. So film festivals, like theaters, right, had to shut down. So people who had been planning their film festival for a year... Um, with a lot of effort, you know, and, and as you know, as a former film festival producer yourself, you put a lot of work into that. How disappointing was it for these festivals to realize all of a sudden we can't have it? It's not going to happen. Well, um, making lemons out of lemonade, I would say that I would say about seventy percent of them were already mentally considering going digital anyway. Um, they just never had the the reason to. They've all mm-hmm. had conversation. I'd say mm-hmm. seventy per sixty to seventy percent have had conversations of having some online presence. COVID just simply flipped the switch for them and forced them to 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 pivot and make transitions like the rest of the world has. And I can't tell you, we've had a handful of festivals that when finished, they were like, "Wow, this is this is the greatest thing." Um, we're going to do this every year. I wish we'd have done it sooner. Uh, so, I mean, not unlike the rest of the world having to to sort of figure things out, film festivals are, are, are we're not immune to that. Pun intended. Uh, mm-hmm. To to having to to figure it out. I mean, the world is digital anyhow. I, I mean, it's just sort of the necessary next step in the evolution of entertainment and. Technology, bringing the. So there's been an opportunity here, and you know, right here, uh, we've had three or four or five different programmers who have dedicated almost all their time to getting this uh, to be everything it can be as far as a positive experience from the film festival host to the the film festival audience member. From the host's perspective, most film festivals sort of revolve around a theme, right? What are some of the themes that you guys have signed up for Festivity, for example? Uh, well, I always say the riches are in the niches, and the most successful events and festivals are the ones that focus on a specific demographic. Uh, the horror market is fantastic. Faith, fantastic. Um, we have a lot of urban black film festivals, that are well we signed up some lbgtq film festivals um but i to say what the most successful is i don't know yet until we get a a true or big picture after at least one year well just like you said they're all sort of revolved around theme we did the puerto rico film festival which was one i know we're doing burbank um, well, those weren't themes; those are locations. <laughs> well, but what? What wasn't there a theme to the Puerto Rico Film Festival of some kind? No, not that I know of. Wasn't no, it all in no, Spanish? No, I don't believe it. What? 
It was in Spanish, yeah. I mean, it was well, I mean, that's a bit of a, a, a qualifier. Well, I mean, it was Spanish independent film, yeah. I mean, but by it, what they didn't they didn't have a specific like. We have a disability film festival. We have a vegan film festival. I hmm. mean, I wouldn't call hmm. Puerto Rico any theme at all. It was an independent film uh, focused on educating entertainment in uh, underprivileged communities. And they were just using this as a vehicle t- to reach out. So the, 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 ma- the vast majority of people who, who buy tickets and go to these film festivals, wherever they are, all, all the way from Cannes and Sundance down to the smallest little niche uh, film festival, what they see is, you know, is material that you're not going to find on Netflix, right? You're not going to find, even if the theaters were open, the reason you go to a film festival is that's the only place to see these films. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, by and large. I mean, you'll never see the shorts, most of the shorts that are played anywhere. Um, A lot of, uh, you know, a lot of festivals will have maybe one or two premiere films that you may see on Netflix or Hulu or Amazon. Um, The others will, you know... If they're lucky, you might be able to get, see them somewhere along the line on some platform. Most are just there to service the filmmaking community, mm-hmm. uh, who these filmmakers put their blood, sweat, and tears into, made a project, and now they do what's called the festival circuit. They submit it to a bunch of festivals, and they're you know ostensibly they want to look for distribution. Now the the landscape has changed where there's a lot of DIY distribution going on. And it's just a great way to get recognized, too, as a filmmaker. Our platform allows filmmakers to introduce their own films. They just record a 30-second thing from their phone. Hi, I'm Keith Mitchell. Thanks for watching Lost in the Woods. And boom, they upload it directly right in front of their film. Most of these filmmakers never get a chance to do that. Hmm. And, um, And furthermore... Most of these filmmakers, family members, they're not going to go to the Topeka Film Festival if you live up in Oregon. But guess what? They can now because it's online. Hmm. And that's an opportunity for these filmmakers to tell all their friends and family, please go. And some of our smart festivals are, you know, using our online voting tool for marketing. So now these filmmakers are telling everybody, hey, go to the festival, buy the cheapest pass they have. And vote for me. <laughs> and it seems to be working to some extent. So you know, I think this is familiar to a lot of people, but maybe not so familiar to others. So I want to bring this all the way down to you know, kindergarten level. If you're going to go to the Topeka Film Festival, that means you're going to have to go to Topeka. And when you get to the festival, they're going to have one film shown in a high school gymnasium and one film shown in a car garage somewhere, right? And somebody else's film Mm -hmm. shown in a small little theater and maybe another film shown in the lobby of a business. And you buy your pass for sometimes for the week because you like uh, Kansas-themed films, we'll just say, for the Topeka Film Festival, historical films of Kansas, Kansas industry. It's something you're interested in, and it's something you can't find on TV. So you go there with your past, and maybe you'll go Tuesday night and see a couple, and then you go Wednesday night, and you go to a Q&A with a director, and then you go, you skip Thursday, but Friday night's what you wanted to see, and you wait in line, and you see these. So you went to the Topeka Film Festival, you bought a pass, you saw four or five different films, you had an, an interactive experience. Well, the festival's closed. So now you go, what I was kind of, you could say, all right, Topeka says you can watch our film festival digitally. It's the same dates, right? This is date specific. Wednesday night, these are the films, Thursday night. And you still get to pick and choose. But now you can probably even see more of the projects if you mm-hmm. want to. And you get to go home, watch them on your 60-inch big screen in the air-conditioned comfort of your living room instead of in some uh, maybe hot, sweaty high school gym. But the same projects, the same films are showing. It looks great, and you kind of get to see those films because you're still at the film festival. You're just watching it at home or on your phone or something, right? Yep, you nailed it right there. And, you know, we are actually launching a networking tool as well for people to talk in real time. Like, you can even meet and bump into other filmmakers. Hey, what did you see in real time on, like, a Reddit-type thread? Hmm. We're, we're creating all these cool tools, where, uh, uh, tools that... Like I truly mean, we can offer everything that you can do at your live event, except possibly give them food and drink. 
Mm-hmm. And even mm-hmm. then, there's some festivals that are partnering with the local Grubhub saying, hey, if you give out this discount code and deliver food during this time, you get this discount. So this festival's out there getting creative with it. No one so how, how does Festivity work? Do, if I want to see the films, do I go to Festivity.com and I can watch all your film festivals, or how does it work? No, you go to the festival website. They'll have a link that is always there during their live event, and you'll click on that link, and it'll take it to their digital theater. And their digital theater will have everything they, they want you to see from schedule, film panels. Um, they, 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 they're, they're, there's many different ways that these festival directors are organizing their site. Mm-hmm. Some offer screenplay competitions. You can click on a screenplay link and read screenplays. Uh, there's, uh, we have a festival that is uh, doing a screenplay roundtable read hmm. event, which is kind of fun. You click on it, you can, you can, they're recording the roundtable read. Um, and then you just, it's just like walking in the, their a regular theater. You pick, the, except most theaters, unless it's a multiplex, maybe we'll have, say a multiplex has 12 theaters. This has unlimited amount of theaters that you can walk into. And I want to watch this now. I want to watch this now. And it's viewing on demand for the length of the festival that the the director sets. Hmm. The beautiful part about this is sponsors are loving it because they get more than just a step and repeat banner. uh, You know, normally you just get a logo on a step and repeat banner and maybe a booth if they have an expo portion of their event. But now they can upload commercials. They can upload intros. We have one festival that had their key... Their online keynote address was done by the CEO of their gold sponsor. I mean, how cool is that? Mm-hmm. And the gold sponsor doesn't have to fly anywhere. I think it was um, uh, Kinkos. Hmm. Yeah, big, a big, big corporate CEO. Hmm. So, um, yeah, so it's a lot of fun things that, that, that you can do. You're not constrained by time and space with our platform. Now, I tell festival directors, this is in no way, shape, or form to usurp your live event. This is to digitally expand and extend it. In a normal world, they would host their live event, film everything during the live event, all the panels, the Q&As, and everything, and upload it to the platform during the live event. And maybe on the last day or two, you open up the digital extension. And then you market to all your constituents then. Hey, be sure to log on. Starting tomorrow, our digital theater's open. See what you've seen already again or see hmm. what you've missed. And, so, um, yeah. So e- each film festival is still responsible to market their festival to their constituents. We don't, Festivity doesn't do that for them. Uh, they, yeah. they know how to market their festival. But is there any way, if I were listening to this podcast, and I'm just curious what, you know, what festivals Festivity is uh, broadcasting next week or the next month, is there anywhere I can go on and see what list of what's coming? And maybe I hadn't heard of uh, the Topeka Film Festival, but I would check it out. Is there, any, is there any kind of master list that's anywhere? Currently, no, but that's a, not a bad idea. Um, we rely on the festivals because their customers are their customers, and um, we don't currently market what's coming mm-hmm. up and what's you know what's not. But it's not a bad idea to we, we'll do on our social channels, you know, stuff. Hey, be sure to, to log in, but that's just to our customers. Mm-hmm. But um, as Festivity grows, every festival wouldn't mind if we sent them new customers, right? So, no, not if, at all. So we told someone the Puerto Rico Film Festival was coming up, and it was fantastic. Uh, it was in Spanish, and someone said, anyway, we, can, we should promote the festivals as best we can, too. Um, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. So from, so I, you know, as a filmmaker, I have to go to, the, I, I get to go to these festivals sometimes with a project. And it just so happens I was at a film festival last weekend. Maybe it was two weekends ago. Um, it was down in Nashville, and we drove down there. And, you know, I sort of liked this particular festival. It was called the Christian Worldview Film Festival. And I decided sort of late in the game to show up. I know we had submitted um, a short documentary that we made called Song Chul, North Korea. And that was a documentary I was very proud of. We shot it, you know, in South Korea. It was a true story. We brought a really good cinematic uh, approach to the story. But I decided rather than just sit at home and watch it online, I, I wanted to drive to Nashville, about a nine-hour drive, so that I could, you know, rub shoulders with people, meet some people, make some friends. 
And you know, the thing about the film festival is I end up wandering in and watching things I didn't know I wanted to see. It's like the old days when you could window shop at Blockbuster. You kind of can't do that anymore. And I just like, oh, this looks interesting. And I'd walk in and, mm -hmm. you know, I had a good time watching a bunch of shorts. I would have never thought I would enjoy shorts, but they were really interesting. And I saw a couple of films that I would never have seen otherwise. And that's sort of the joy of a film festival. It's you're going to discover stuff you didn't know you wanted to see. You haven't, you know, seen the yeah. sponsorship at McDonald's for, for this particular film. But, but sometimes they're truly rewarding experiences. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean... There are, um, I wouldn't say it's a huge, like, hobby festival attendees. Most people who attend film festivals have, are one or two people removed from being involved with that festival. Or it's corporate sponsor, if it's a local thing, too, that, that raises money and brings awareness to the city. But, yeah, I mean, that's the, the whole point. It's just throwing a party, setting us the backdrop of entertainment. Hmm. And um, and if you're having a good time, you're you're throwing a good party, and whether that's live or on or, or online, it should be no difference. The the attendees should be able to discover content that they otherwise never would get a chance to see. And um, yeah, I mean that's hmm. it's the nature well, of the biz. Anyone knows how to throw. A good party. It's Keith and Kim Mitchell, I can tell you that. Ah. Yeah, my <laughs> Mikasa Sukasa. So we go to this f film festival. One of the things that brings all of us there is the chance on the awards festival that you mm. might you might come home with one of these, right? Shameless everyone, plug. I everyone. Like so if you can't read that, that says best short documentary. Um, but seriously, I mean, for better or worse. Uh, and I suppose it'd be interesting to discuss that for a bit. But at the end of these festivals, there's often an awards night. And sometimes you put on your suit and they go through best animated and best short and best actor and this and that, little mini awards. And, um, and you know, you sit there and like, ah, this, we don't do this for the awards. And, and you kind of, ah, you know, it's, it's an awkward position. And also, a film is made by so many people that whoever gets to walk up and say thank you, the director or the producer, is doing so on behalf of a lot of people. But nevertheless, it's still a big part of the festivals. And it can give the better films the kind of recognition they need to hopefully reach some more eyeballs, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we do awards? Can we do awards on a virtual film festival? Well, yeah. Burbank, they did a pre-recorded awards show all on Zoom where they had all their nominees on standby in this room. They recorded it. The host was in a tuxedo <clears throat> and read the, the winnie, winners. The, the recipient stepped up. They let him into the room. Thank you. They did a great job. Wow. Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in a COVID world, that's, that's getting really, really cool. We had another festival doing something similar, but they didn't produce it as much as Burbank did. In a perfect world, you'd just turn the camera on and film it and then mm -hmm. upload it directly to... I'm hoping this is in the next year. Not everybody's going to be doing the Zoom meetings. But you know what? I don't know. I just had a festival, the Las Vegas... The, the La, um, I, I don't know, a festival just dangled out there that they may be canceling their live event and make it 100% online. And I was like, wow, <laughs> I didn't see that coming. <laughs> well, like you said, you can invite people from a much wider geographic area than if they have to show up in, uh, in Topeka. I mean, you can, can you take it worldwide? Can you invite people from Germany to come to your Topeka Festival? There's Absolutely. no uh, geo restrictions on this. Nope. We're doing a festival. I got a call uh, with London. Um, we did Puerto Rico, like you said, a couple overseas. Australia I'm talking to. Um, yeah, there's no, you're not constrained by time or space, that's for sure. So what about for the filmmaker? Am I worried at all about uh, this is going to uh, somehow infringe on my distribution opportunities? Or uh, as a filmmaker goes, do I want more people at the film festival to see it or fewer? What do I want? So every once in a while, we'll have uh, a festival director say, hey, do you have a security and standards document that we have a distributor who wants to see it? 
uh, to sign off on DRM and all that. I won't bore you with the details behind all that. And that document has been suffice across the board. In terms of um, it, fest- most festivals aren't markets. Markets are where distributors go to find films. They're specifically, I've, I've you know, worked in that space. I went to a lot of film festivals sp- specifically to acquire films to distribute. Um, and by I mean markets, Tribeca, Sundance, and the, I'm talking really the U.S., um, there's, there's really only a handful of those where it's flooded with distributors, Toronto, North America, you know. What a digital extension does now open up is the possibility of a distributor stumbling across this festival. Hey, you know what? I'm going to take a peek at this. You know, I'll buy it all access pass for $19.99 and just go through the list. And I try to explain to the festival directors, the best thing that can happen for your film festival is a distributor acquires a film out of your festival. Because once that happens, you can promote that. And then the next year, you're going to get flooded with more. So I, I've encouraged these people to send out a press release to Hollywood so it runs in the trade so there's millions of boutique distributors hmm. and um, we have the Phoenix Fear Con which they have it is a it is a horror film distribution film festival they have I think there's like five five horror films specifically worldwide distributors attend the winner gets the top three winners get a distribution deal um I can very easily see next year that a lot of distributors will stop. Why would I? Why would I want to spend the money to get on a plane to go to? They're still going to go to 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 the Sundances, the places like that. They're not necessarily going to go to the Phoenix Faircon or the mm. uh, Threadbare Mitten or the Las Vegas Black Film Festival. Or the Chicago Horror Film Festival, you know, I can go on and on, but they are going to go to this. So, I was talking. I, I don't do a lot of the customer service, but the phone was ringing the other day, and I picked up, and it was the director of the of the Las Vegas Black Film Festival, and she said they had a fantastic year. That they had more participants than ever. They were really happy with Festivi. It's 115 degrees outside. They don't even want to go outside and stand right. in line. And so they're <laughs> staying inside in the in the cool of their homes. And she said this festival was a success. So what have you heard? Have the festival directors been pleased with? Uh, every one of them, hundred percent. Never okay. had. Um, uh, every one of them have have been really happy with. Hi, Judy. You're on um, the podcast. I want to hear the answer to that. <laughs> All right, there's there's Judy on the podcast. Say hi to our worldwide listeners. This is the podcast. Yeah, she just walked right in the studio here, and (laughs) the brains behind Festivy, right there. Get on the podcast, and I I saw it was Keith, and I thought, oh, this is just an internal meeting. So this is Judy, my wife. She's been running the Festivy uh, team. Why don't you tell the podcast audience how has the from a development side? What have you guys been doing to develop Festivy as a as a stable platform? This will teach you to walk in my office. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you, Judy is the brains behind this operation. And her, her development team is top notch. And when our platform isn't Amazing. built by us, it's suggested by film festival directors. I run it by Judy and she will either respond, yes, that's a good idea. Let's put it on the list and they'll start tackling it. And before this is all said and done, this this platform isn't built by us. It's built by you, the film festivals. Yeah. And that's I just what got you... off the phone with our, we have a daily huddle, and I just got off the phone with them, and I'm just really excited to share with you, Keith, what we'll be introducing on Monday. Oh. Releasing. So, top secret. I'm not going to talk oh, about it now. Darn, I want to hear now. Yeah. Well, it's something Break you've been it. waiting for. <laughs> and it's working great. It's cool. Awesome. Okay. Sorry okay. to interrupt. Thanks, Judy. Top Duty. secret. Yeah. Top secret. Well, that's a tease for you. I don't even know what it is. So. <laughs> yeah. It's a much wanted feature. That's great. Um, a wanted feature. They so have really been doing a great job too, and uh, it's it's really fun to see the possibility, the endless possibilities of what truly this can turn into. I mean. So yeah. what's the experience like for a viewer? I mean. Um, 
how how good do the films look at home? How good do they sound? What's the you know what? It's it? no different than logging into a new Netflix account. Same exact user experience. You just create a username, password, enter in your payment. Get, boom, you're in, and you'll have access to all the films for the whole length of the festival. It's do, it's, do they sell all access passes? Do some sell individual sell, per yeah, per thing? All access, some sell individuals, some sell bundles, some sell blocks, some sell just okay. shorts, some sell just pages. A page would be like a Tuesday. They want to just market the Tuesday. My opinion is I, I try to push everybody just to sell the all access. Mm-hmm. And, but they have reasons why, mm-hmm. and, uh, and we can accommodate them. In. So how how hard is this? If I'm a if I'm a festival director and I'm used to people you know mailing me their films, but, but I'm not very technical. Uh, what kind of uh, fears do you run into from film festival directors who aren't sure how to work, uh, don't think they're programmers, or don't know how to work? It's uh, a very very good question because that's probably one of the top top five questions I get right out of the gate. I'm not very technical. The first thing I say to them is, neither am I. And I promise you, once I show you how to use this, they're like, wow, this is easy. We actually have a tool that nobody's built, that Judy and the team built, where now the directors don't even have to upload and fill in, don't have to upload the films at all, don't have to fill in the information, the metadata, the name, the tagline, the credits, they don't do any of that. It's an invite link directly to the accepted film festival filmmaker, and they do all the heavy lifting. Hmm. All the film festival has to do is literally spin up their digital theater, microsite, what we call it, enter some logos, some branding, some information, activate it, and they're ready to and maybe coordinate, collate how you want these to play. But by and large, it's it's so easy to use. John, even you could do it. <laughs> What are some examples? I mean, I know a, a podcast like this, uh, the film festivals are on and off, but are there any URLs people could go to say, oh, that's a festivity festival, or oh, that's one. Can we send people to anywhere that would be active? The ones that are there? live right now are cinemasoup.festivity.com, and I think Chicago Horror Festival.festivity.com is live right now. Um, those are the only two that are live. Burbank starts next week. The Burbank Film Festival dot festivy dot com, or you can just go. You can just Google any of those names in a, on their website. It'll say click here to enter our digital theater, or, you know, online festival, and you can have access to them right there. Now we're going to be coming up to the busiest season, right? I mean, really, the fall is when the festivals really kick in. Is that right? Or is that am I right? Yes, about that? yes. I mean, uh, October, September, October. Are Those are big, big, big times. Big November, and then on the heels of Sundance, it picks right back up after at the end of January, February, March. The, it's really a dead period. Um, summertime, May, mm-hmm. June, July. So. Right as we really got the uh, software, everything at the at its best is kind of when we hit the dead period, right? So you're looking forward to a big influx of new festivals this fall? Yeah, we should we should uh, we got a, a, a ton spun up. We'll have about by the end of the year. I'm hoping we will have done between 45 and 50 by the end of the this first year. We will have actually had done about that many, and then. I got a handful of sites that have spun up. They have, they're just playing around with it. They haven't really 100% committed. But mm-hmm. a, And as time goes by, the word is getting out on us on a, a lot of these film threads. I'm told this, and I've explored a couple on Facebook uh, where people are talking favorably about us. There's a couple other uh, platforms that have popped up. They do it. They do a fine job, but they had to pivot. These were other companies doing other things, mostly event ticketing or um, uh, 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 other stuff. And they recognize their, their company will fold if they don't, and they don't do something. So they spun up the ability to offer an online version to these festivals that they normally would just sell tickets for. Because they have a full technology staff on thing. And they just deliver the content. It's not a lot of branding. 
But so I mean I love competition. I don't <laughs> never want to badmouth any one of them. But. Well, good word of mouth is what you'd be after, right? Everybody who has an experience with Festivy, if if they speak positively about it, that's the best yep. endorsement we could ever get. Yeah, yeah. We got a couple guys out there who they manage multiple film festivals. If these guys pull the trigger on their first one, they're gonna. I mean, one guy manages ten, another guy manages about twenty, and. They're doing their first ones, and it, I mean, this could just, I, in a perfect world, I want to see us doing 200, 300 film festivals a year. For sure. You know? How does somebody get started? I mean, what if uh, I'm not sure what to do with my festival? I don't know by then if theaters are going to be open. I don't know what the rules in my state are going to be, uh, but I'm, I want to explore putting my festival online. Is it difficult? Uh, it's very easy. Go to festivee.com. Hit Get Started Now for free. Click on that. Answer three questions. You'll have a digital theater spun up. And then we will automatically see that. We'll reach out to you and say, hey, do you want a tutorial? And then I'll walk you through the platform. The beautiful thing about this is your real entrepreneurial filmmakers are going to catch wind of this and are going to realize, wow, I can get really creative with this. I can go out with my phone and create my own festival. I can spin up a site, it's free. I can, I can send out to all my social media followers, hey, give me your, your best two minute video of you dunking a basketball. And it's a slam dunk festival. And you charge four ninety nine to see it. People could do stuff like that. And it would take all of one day. And now you'd have to curate a bunch of things like that. But hmm. if you're entrepreneurial, this is a way to make money. Chloe, I've had a conversation with my daughter, who's become TikTok famous. And she has 3 million followers on TikTok. I, I'm i trying to talk her into doing a TikTok film festival. Hmm. Good and idea. I said, honey, you could, bla- you could, you could create a, your best TikTok videos. People are all making them. Have them submit to your festival, and you have a, re- a three million person reach for kind wow. of wow. I mean, you could make a, a, a killing, Keith. If you can't close that deal, yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> win-win. I know. Poor thing wow. just started college, so I can't really overwhelm her with doing a film festival. Oh, but, uh, college can yeah. wait. Keith, come on. You know <laughs> I that. Know. <laughs> I got to sit her down and say, this is what it would look like. Daddy would hold your hand. But, wow. Yeah, I mean, there's many ways to, to use this, too. And, you know, let's not forget, this isn't just for film festivals. This is for all events, too. We did, using the Festivy platform, we did Date Night with Gary Chapman. And that was a smashing success. So if you have an event that you want to, to put out to the world, everything's built in and integrated and from ticketing to everything, it's, it's one-stop shopping. If you want to host an event and you want to do it online, no need to look any further. Just go to Festivy and we can accommodate. So the difference between that and a YouTube video, the date night with Gary Chapman, and I won't, I won't say how many tickets they sold because that's their information, but, but you can sell tickets. So if you even wanted to do a rock concert, I mean, if, if, yeah. if, uh, if you're the band, whatever, mm-hmm. Sticks, and no one's coming to your shows, you guys could put on a live Sticks concert somewhere at some cool venue and sell tickets, and Festivy will send you the money for those tickets, and you can do a live event and sell tickets and just come to Festivy and put it on. Yep, you sure can. You absolutely can. And if you use some of our other tools, you can even meet and greet your audience. And you can even talk to your audience. At, you know, We have live streaming tools now that Judy and the team have just, just worked beautifully with. And um, there's just a lot of, there's many ways to skin this, this online cat, if you will. And um, we're, we're merely at the starting gate. As we continue on in this new world, if you will, I'm convinced that this is the new norm. The new norm will be this. And what scares me a little bit is that theaters uh, are going to have to catch up pretty quickly because 
people are going to get used to not going to a theater to consume content. And once that they get used to that, they're going to have to figure out ways to uh, get original. And um, th- there might be a partnership with our platform with some theaters as well. Mm-hmm. And I'm not entirely sure what that looks like, nor do I want to put it out in the public just yet mm-hmm. until I have a conversation with a friend over at, at yeah, the right. theater chain we know. But I have some ideas. And... Um, and it's fun. Well, we're talking with Keith Mitchell today and the No Shame Podcast. And, you know, this whole podcast was something that was born out of conversations with you, Keith, and at the intersection of, of faith and culture. And it seems like this festive conversation doesn't have a whole lot to do with faith because, you know, we're just helping put, promote other people's content and other people's film festivals. Is there any aspect of your faith that affects the, 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 the charge you've been leading for Festivy these last five months? Well, yeah, I mean, one of the things I realize is God has a plan. And this world we live in right now has been so disruptive. I have actually found it to be very calming, simply because I have no other options. What I mean by that is if I allowed myself to get caught up in just the brokenness of this world that everybody is getting caught up in and not lean into my faith and my love for the Lord, I would absolutely be sitting on a bar stool in Tijuana. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even joking. Mm -hmm. And I'm really, I'm not even trying to be glib about that. Mm -hmm. So what this platform that we've built has allowed me to talk to different people, different races, different cultures nationwide on a regular basis. Hmm. And I'm I'm talking every walks of life. Hmm. And it's allowed me to, to, to get to know a gay person from Chicago, a black person from Las Vegas. Uh, you know, and I've really, really have loved it. Hmm. I have really enjoyed 99% of my conversations <laughs> and where I otherwise never would have. And they will, they will want to talk a little bit about what's going on in the world. And hmm. I'm not shy. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm a talker too. So I will find myself engaging in conversations with people that I otherwise wouldn't have. Mm-hmm. And knowing that it's only my faith that's keeping me tethered to, to, to being able to have a rational conversation with other people saying stuff that I don't really agree with, but I want to hear them out and I want to hear their side. It's just, and, and I thank Festivy for that because it's truly allowed me to to grow not only as an entrepreneur, businessman, employee, but as a man of faith. The man well, who follows Christ. That's really and, cool. And, you know, Keith, um, you know, you're just, Keith was uh, so tuned into this vibe, you know, and the, and the way we met Keith uh, six years ago was the new whole, the new Hollywood Film Festival. And Keith and his partner were the first guys that ever came around saying, we want to do an online digital film festival. You were, you were truly a pioneer in this space. I mean, there's just no other way to put it. And new whole happened and it was a huge success. And through that, um, you you ended up choosing our company to build the platform and thank the Lord that you and Kim and your beautiful kids end up moving to Michigan and joining our team. And now five years into that, you being able to make that experience available for every other film festival, hopefully in the country and the world, is is a fit that's just so natural and, uh, and perfect for your experience and your passion and your skill set. I just... I'm super proud of the work you guys have done. I'm super proud of the leadership you've given to the team. And I know that when we talk to these people, um, like you said, from all over the world, that you do represent for every one of them a company that cares about them, that'll do their best for them, that wants them to succeed. Uh, These are the kind of values that we're definitely rooted in. And it's cool to hear you say that even the relationships um, that are happening through this kind of non-relationship era that we've been living in, are only here because because you and the team have built this platform to be what it is so far. Yeah, yeah, and uh, 
yeah, John, you've created a wonderful culture over there that that I I'm I'm very very grateful for, and um, the team, the staff is just they're all amazing. So I I uh, I think that I mean bright things are going to happen. You're leaving for Romania soon. We got America Studios yeah. on the horizon. God's got a plan, and um, well, we just got to see it through. What is will be done. I always wonder, you know, who listens to a podcast or who watches a podcast like this? And I'm pretty sure if anyone's stuck with us this far, it's probably not because they necessarily have a film festival or they've got, I mean, it's probably just a normal person. And uh, I hope this has been an interesting conversation, but this is an example of how one small American company has had to pivot during the time of COVID. And rather than just shut down and go home and collect unemployment, I mean, we've kept working, we've kept at it. The whole staff has been working harder than ever to develop this platform and to tweak it and to improve it. And you saw Judy <laughs> crash the party here and say, we've got a secret announcement coming out next Monday. Adding features is the result of hard work and discussion and innovative and feedback with customers. And that's true whatever business you're in. If you're a tailor shop, or if you're a hot dog stand, or if you're a counselor, or if you've got some kind of a coach, whatever business you've been in, it might be time that you've got to have a, a new way to think about what you offer people. Um, and I'm not trying to make light of the difficulty that there's been that has caused so many businesses to close. That's just a reality. Not everybody has the ability. If you're a restaurant, you're a restaurant. But I hope that, Keith, you know, your energy and leadership that says we're not just going to put our head in the sand and cry that stuff we were planning to do isn't going to work. Uh, and we don't know, obviously, everyone doesn't know what success can be, but you have worked hard. And when people are working from home, you know, the boss isn't watching. We don't know if people start on time or finish on time. It's, there's an awful lot of trust going on with a company that's working from home. But you're saying, hey, these guys are working hard and the team has been progressing on a daily basis to make improvements and to respond. And you're seeing the result. The customer base is growing to where we have our sights on, you know, hundreds and hundreds of festivals that will use this platform to reach their constituents. I hope we make it. Hmm. That's Keith Mitchell from Festivy on the No Shame podcast. Thank you for joining us. And Keith, get back to work. Thanks, John. Bye now. <laughs> Bye. No Shame is a weekly podcast where John Groders discusses life at the intersection of faith and culture with all kinds of interesting and inspiring guests. Subscribe to the podcast today by going to johngroders.com, select the podcast tab, and hit subscribe. Don't miss any of these life-giving conversations. <laughs>